is. Okay, welcome to another episode of the Lisa Mitchell Show. I am your host and founder of Power Body Language, Lisa Mitchell. And this season is all about powering your presence and how you can show up in the room as your most clued in and confident self in any situation. And I have the perfect guest on today to really help you power your presence and um, really learn how to how to make big strides and how to be part of something amazing and bigger than yourself. So Terry B. Williams is my guest today. Um, Terry, welcome so much for, uh, thanks so much for joining me today on the show. Thank you for having me. And I want to start powering my own president. So let's do this. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, so just, uh, you know, so the audience has a little bit of background on how Terry and I got, got connected. We met at the See It to Be It Success Summit that was held in Austin earlier this year. Um, our mutual friend, uh, Melinda, invited us both to attend and, um, and both got a little bit of stage time there with our, our different area of expertise. And Terry was on a panel that was really focused on activism and all the different formats that activism can take. And, and Terry, I just was so just drawn to your story and so just really hanging on the edge of my seat as you kind of talked about your journey and your experiences. And I would love for you to, to share with um, the listeners a little bit more about what your history looks like, because it's not, it's not a, a, a normal, everyday expected story. So I'd love for you to share a little bit about that. Yeah, it is definitely not an everyday story, um, but one that began that way. So I always knew I wanted to be Barbara Walters. I was literally the kid that would cheer, skip the after party, go home to watch 2020. Like I love to do that on Friday. And so I started as a television reporter um, at the age of 16 in my hometown of Lafayette, Louisiana. Coolest thing ever, we get checked out of school by a photographer, get to interview people like the attorney general, um, and then go to school the next day. And I really studied my craft and just, you know, knew I was going to be in that newsroom. And so I worked all the way through college, graduated college early because I had um, a full-time job at a television station in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, because I am an LSU grad. And, um, really worked hard. So that was my second television station. Um, by the time I was 24, I was in Columbia, South Carolina at my third television station, well on my way to becoming Barbara Walters. And one day I um, started crying in the car and I couldn't really explain why, but I felt like um, I was really not doing what I was supposed to be doing. Hmm. I knew I, you know, started working in television because I wanted to give people information so they can make decisions about themselves and their community. Um, but I really didn't feel like I was doing that. So I walked away from it all, broke a contract. Um, the news director was not kind to me, threatened to sue me. Yeah, all sorts of things. But um, when you throw something out in the universe, it knows how to show up and it knows when to show up. So I was on my last week at, at the job. I gave a proper two-week notice and got a phone call um, from a children's museum. And I told them, you know, thank you for their help. And I was leaving. They asked me if I wanted to go and work there. Well, right along that time, I was talking to my mentors um, and telling them that I wanted to switch careers and really, really wanted to get in politics. Like election night was the, the time that I loved the most in the newsroom. And they told me, ironically, that I had to learn how to do fundraising if I wanted to get into politics. The Children's Museum asked me if I wanted to be a fundraiser on their capital campaign team. So the stars were aligning. And very long story short, but I did that for a year. And a year later, um, joined a U.S. Senate campaign as the communications director and press secretary. And so that was my entry point into um, the political world. Wow. Well, my so I, I want to stop there for a second because you, you brought up something really key. And I think that this is something that, that so many people that listen to this are going to, are going to resonate with is you had that moment and I could, I could hear it in your voice when you were like, plans changed. Right. And that's such a pivotal moment. And how do you, how did you at that stage early, kind of early in your career on track to exactly what you thought you wanted and when your heart started to ping, 
that it wasn't aligned anymore? Like where, did, how did you find the bravery? What did you call on in that time to, to follow that new path? Cause I think that's where so many people get like that stutter step and they're like, Oh, I'm not where I am. Like it's, it's not panning out the way I thought, but how, what do I do now? Yeah. I will answer that question, but I, I also want to say it's important that your, um, you know, those that subscribe to your show that they know it'll happen once, it'll happen twice. It'll probably happen more than three times in your life, but every time you have to step up and be brave um, because it will never be seamless, right? right? So, and the way it feels when you're 24 is so much different than the way it feels when you're 40, which I'm 40 um, today and I own every bit of those decades. So, um, Really, I was blessed. I had parents that definitely questioned me a whole lot, but supported that decision. And I had surrounded myself with big brothers and sisters. You know, they were people that were five to 10 years older than me. I didn't really consider them mentors at the time, but they surely were. Um, and they're like, you know, we got you. We're going to help you figure this out. And really, truly, gave me that confidence that I needed. It helps me power my presence so that I could just jump and say yes. And, you know, I'm a person of faith. So I knew that where I was, was not where I was going to end up. And I had to take that chance. Um, best decision ever, you know? So again, I had a, there was a pivot because my candidate lost. And then on election night, after that first jump, I'm again, just a year and a half later, faced with a second jump in something to figure out again. And that was when I made the, the shift to lobbying. Yeah. So that's such an interesting, I, I love that, you know, you, you kind of um, broke your teeth on this first election and, and it didn't come out with your candidate on top, but the learnings that you took then prepared you to continue to further, even in a new and interesting way, uh, further your path into politics. And I think when, when people hear the word lobbyist, Right. Like when I heard it, when I saw your name and then, you know, lobbyist in, in your bio on the on the uh, conference sheet, I was like, who? Like, what's that <laughs> about? Like, who does that? Right. Like, I kind of just have been conditioned to have like a, this kind of weird, negative, ambiguous connotation with with the term lobbyist. And then meeting you and hearing more of your story, you've completely changed. Um what I associate with that word, which is, I think, a, a testament to the power of your passion and, and your point of view that you bring into it. So I'd love to hear, uh, you know, more about what that lobbying experience uh, meant to you. And I'd, I'd love to hear it from what you thought it would be yeah. and, and the contrast to what it, what it ended up being, if there was a difference. Yeah, it, it, I get that often, I have to say. I am a lobbyist and I've worked on some extremely hard campaigns at state capitals. Um, but there are so many different kinds of lobbyists. You know, I have been lobbying for the past 17 years, um, but 15 of those at the American Heart Association. So um, I, I often share this. When I started lobbying, I had never been to a state capitol since fifth grade. And that night that we lost, a mentor of mine looked me in the eye and said, you need to become a lobbyist. And I looked at him and I'm, I made the comment, you know, like Elle Woods. Right. Because Literally. that's who we know, right? Literally, that was the only lobbyist I knew. And I knew she saved the dogs and all these things. But he really explained it to me. He's like, it is nothing different from what you did in television nothing different than what you did when you made an ask um, as a fundraiser. And so that really, again, talk about people in your life that help you power your presence. That gave me the confidence that I needed. So two months later, I was lobbying in a state capitol. And so I didn't really know what to expect. Um, and that first day was so very intimidating. You know, I was under the age of 25. Um, not only was I a female, but I was a, a woman of color in a space that really was driven by white males in a very Southern state. Cause at that point I moved back home to Louisiana. And so I just, I knew that I had to show up brave every day and I would fall and, you know, I couldn't stop there. I had to, I truly had to keep it moving. And, and so what I learned that very first year of lobbying is it is a test of endurance and grit and intelligence. Um, and I 
really think I was able to survive and pass legislation that first year because I was humble, because I had faith and fortitude, because I asked for help. You know, when you ask people for help instead of pretending to know what you're supposed to be doing, um, sometimes they, they tend to take you under their wing and treat yeah. you like a daughter or a sister. And that really got me a long way. So very quickly, those same men that were, were helping me um, had to shift gears a little bit and see, see me as truly the opponent that I was. Right. Um, and to this day, that still helps drive me. Yeah, I love that. And I think that's so important, you know, thinking of, of kind of the science of first impressions and how people are always summing up and making assumptions about your capability and in your grit and your endurance, like in, in just a matter of seconds so quickly. <laughs> this is real life, y'all. <laughs> For those of you not watching and just listening, I just, yeah, we, we just had a little cameo. So work, work from home mom, right? Um, yeah, so I, I think it's it's just using that first impression, right? Because I'm sure there's times where you could immediately be, uh, you know, a, assertive, competent, confident, all of those things. And then there were probably times where you could craft that first impression a little differently, where maybe being underestimated would serve you better or have you better received. <laughs> right. And I, I think that that's something like we always think, oh, well, you always have to be you know, confident or turned up or whatever when you walk in. And, and one of the things with first impressions, the reason the science works so well is that it, it's a tool for you to decide how does me showing up in this room one way versus the other best serve me and get me closer to my outcomes. So I love that you are able to kind of play and quickly assess the environment that you're walking into and then figure out, okay, what's, what's going to get me closer to my end game here? And being able to make that decision on the fly. That's like such a, a remarkable, remarkable skill that you've developed. I love how you broke it down because I, I don't definitely at that the age of 24, 25, I didn't know that um, it was survival, right? But, you know, as someone that has managed dozens and dozens of people now, um, that is definitely how we we teach people to show up on those first days at their capital or even first days at a coalition meeting, you know, first impressions at City Hall or, you know, at a, a table where they're sitting with members of our board. Um, especially in the work of lobbying, you know, truly, truly, you are showing up making an ask on, on the other end of that power. And so you have to figure out, um, how to measure yourself, you know, to truly um, take the lead when needed, but really not take the baton from the leader when they have it. Um, so it, it, it is a game of, of balance and it's definitely a skill. Yeah, I love that. So when, I, when I'm coaching um, executive clients that are in kind of these high consequence conversations and negotiations and things, there's a, a, a game I like to play called Who Needs the Crown? And that's... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Write it down. And, and that's basically for me it's it's looking at the uh the ego characteristics of the rest of the people in the room and, and ego being everything from how do they feel about themselves to how uh what type of insecurity are they walking in with what kind of triggers do they have what kind of inadequacy might um inform the behavior that they're showing you and sometimes just knowing who needs to wear the crown in a in a high powered situation and gracefully giving them that crown because yeah. you don't have to lose something to give that to someone else can just be that little dynamic that you need to create to then, you know, get closer to the objective that you have. And it's not manipulation. It's just using data, right? That's, that's where I think people get, get body language and communication skills really kind of, uh, you know, twisted a little bit is like, this is not manipulating. This is me assessing and making data point, you know, using data just like you would in any other in any other position to make good decisions, right? How do you? What's your process for kind of sizing somebody up or for assessing um, assessing a room when you walk in? What does that look like for you? You know, and and some of this I've heard you say before. You really have to feel the energy. Um, you have to know if it's going to be a room that's going to welcome how you show up on that day, because we have to be honest with ourselves. Um, you know, there, you're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. You're going to have days where that red dress you have on or that, that 
dark blue suit, it's going to give you more power than, you know, when you have on something that's wrinkled because you didn't have time to iron that morning. But y'all, I'm going to tell you, I rarely iron. That is is my real life. I moved a year and a half ago and I don't know where my iron is. So I have no iron with you right there. (laughs) Right. So overrated. But, um, but you have to feel that energy and quickly assess. And people that can do that in a very seamless way that still allows people to feel open and welcome um, and, and really lets them know that you're listening and paying attention, you will get so far ahead. Um, and, and so it is truly a skill that is needed and one that everyone should practice. Even if it's at home, um, I laugh. Because a lot of times the skills that I learned from people like you who are executive coaches, they work so well on my husband at home. <laughs> That's the added benefit, right? Of professional development is, oh, wait, this stuff works outside of the boardroom too. Yes. Yeah, I love it. So tell me a little bit about um, – the other thing that I get a little cranked up about sometimes is like everybody sees the highlight reel, Right. And, and we, and I am as guilty as anybody else when it comes to, because a big part of our presence now is social media and is, is digital and uh, we're inviting people in, but we're only showing them like a very well controlled snippet. Um, so the, the thing that never makes a highlight reel or, or unless it's someone's, you know, kind of platform is this, you know, the times they got it wrong. Is there, yeah. has there, is there a time that comes to mind where you just like read something wrong or walked in and just got it handed to you? Like, like I, and it's not so much about, you know, necessarily that experience or staying too long in that negativity, but like, it's more about the other side of that, right? Like the rebound and the preparation and the, the managing through that. Yeah. I'll share an example, but it really wasn't, um, wasn't in a room, but it was just last week. (laughs) So, um, you know, I try to appear to have it pulled together. I try to appear that way even when I don't, but I always own up to it. That is one thing that, that I am transparent about. And so I am not tech savvy. I am a 40 year old that is analog all the way. And, um, was doing a webinar on my lunch break last week. And I'm just not good with Zoom and, you know, anything that's on a computer. Like, I have this computer here and I'm not touching it. And so I did something or did not do something I still don't know. And I went mute while leading the webinar and giving a training. (laughs) And I lost video. But, you know, I know that's not a strong suit. And so I started off um, the training by saying I was stretching myself to do the webinar. And and now I know how to do it. So next time I'm going to nail it. And so I think so many times um, we show up and we're not our authentic self and we're not owning where we don't have it together. And that when we we say, you know, I, um, I'm stretching myself, that gives us power that allows us to be authentic. So I showed up in that, that moment, just very graceful, totally a goofball, but I'm okay with that. Um, you know, if I were to walk in a state capital and wasn't confident about the data or didn't know what I was going to say to a lawmaker when I made it that day and, and didn't own up to it, I'm going to look so tense. I'm going to look nervous. I'm not going to look like I'm telling them the truth, yes. even if I am. And so my advice is just to always own it. You know, they even have a bad day. They even get it wrong. Um, and, you know, if they're good, they're going to tell you. Uh, but sometimes you're going to know on the inside too and just chuckle because you know that, you know, your turn could be next. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love the entire, the entire kind of process that you did uh, to manage through that. And I think you brought up such a key point around this, this transparency, right? So being transparent when you're stretching or when you're learning or when you're in something that maybe isn't your strong suit or is, is, you know, really just something you haven't acquired the comfort level or expertise of yet. And owning that up front, just, it does a couple of key things. It sets the expectation for whoever's on the other side of your face about the experience that they're about to have. And it gives them the opportunity to extend grace. Right. And I have found that people have been so gracious 
because mm -hmm. AV is always the downfall of any speaker or trainer, mm -hmm. right? Oh and it doesn't matter how many dongles and adapters and spares and battery, it doesn't matter. Something with the AV will always, always go wrong. I feel you so strongly on that struggle. <laughs> <laughs> it happened again to me uh, last week as well uh, at, a, at a client's office outside of uh, Columbus. I'm like, I brought everything. And then there was still some sort of little, like, little random snafu. And some guy named Fred was gracious enough to give up his laptop for four hours um, so, I could, so I could proceed with my training. But, and that's, you know, that, that grace, that ownership, right, of, like, this is something I just have not mastered. Or this is something I know, like, despite all troubleshooting is probably still going to be something that trips me. Like, people are, you know, people are – all the time, right? People are so appreciative of that, that ownership thing. And that's one of the, you know, in the times I've interacted with you and, um, you know, getting to know you more, Terry, that's one of the things I really appreciate you is, is about you is, um, just your authenticity and the ownership that you have, you know, for, for the good, the bad, the ugly, the strong, the weak, you know, that's, it, I, I'm drawn to you as just a genuine, transparent person. Um, and so thank you for giving that gift to me and, and because we really don't know each other that well, um, you could totally be just, I call them shiny plastics, right? Like the, the women that just are always, always on and have like their social vocal tone and have their like, you know who I'm talking about, right? Like, you know, those women. Um, and I, to be honest, my, my first, like my first impression and you didn't show up like that on the panel at all, but I was like, wow, she's really like completely pulled together. I'll probably never see behind the curtain. <laughs> and our first conversation was completely different. I was so, so excited. I was so excited. I'm like, yes, this is a soul sister. This is a see behind the curtain, you know, experience. And I just, I appreciate you so much for just, you know, showing up in space with me that way. Um, and it just really has like endeared me to you for, for the duration, I believe. So thank you for that. Thank you. But I mean, it took a long time to get there. Um, you know, I, I have a blog, which you mentioned, thank you for that movement maker yes. And I wrote about my struggle with perfectionism, especially when I was younger, um, especially when I was a young manager, you know, I felt like I always had to get it right. Um, and didn't really understand why sometimes people questioned my direction or thought I was being manipulative. You know, when you have instinct for solving problems quickly and you're teetering between like, do I need to be vulnerable and transparent and say I don't have it? Or do I pretend to have it together? That is so dangerous. Um, that is when you fall into a space where people won't trust you and follow your lead. And um, when you're a manager, you need all those things. So I had to learn it the, the hard way. Um, but I do know if people can't accept me on my good days or my bad days, you know, really they can't be a part of the tribe because that is part of the, the journey at work um, and, you know, at home and when I, I play. So I, I appreciate you noticing that because I have worked really hard on that. Yeah. Well, and I, I appreciate your journey because I come from a very similar space and, um, that was the longest, you know, the main reason why I don't, you know, do videos like I should or show up because it's perfectionism, right? It's like, well, I don't feel completely prepared or I don't feel like I look my best or I don't feel like what I have to say is going to impact anybody, you know, just all the head trash that we, that we get caught up in. And, and so thank you for being an example to me of, of how to continue to be brave. And thank you for your incredible work with Movement Maker Tribe. And that's, I, I want to give you a chance to talk about that because I feel like, especially for the people that are listening or watching this, that this is a, a space they need to know about. And this is a community that they need to engage in. Yeah. So it, it really was born because of all my different pivots. You know, I really enjoyed my time in television, really enjoyed my, my time fundraising money and volunteer like an addict for galas and just different ways to help my community. And, um, you know, I'm also just a huge fan of how you can create change in your community through the, your state capital or city hall. And so I didn't really have an outlet for those three things to come together um, and felt a little unfulfilled. And so I um, just went, you know, in this roundabout 
circle for about a year about well, what do I do? How do I get this out in the world? And it goes back to that original thought about why I wanted to start in television. And that was to give people information so they can make decisions for themselves and their community. Yeah. So last March, I started movementmakertribe.com. And it is a place where people that um, want to be inspired to do something big in the world can go to get the tools and skills that they need. So it might be inspiration from someone who has started a nonprofit or started a movement, which I highlighted um, a young adult last week who started a college movement. Or it might be how to earn your seat at the table or how to start um, a fundraiser. All of those things are there so that um, people can learn, but it's also a place where people can share. Um, so I had someone that read an article and then emailed me on Facebook asking for help to get donations um, all the way in Africa. And the tribe showed up. And as a result of that one blog article of, around menstrual cups and a young man by the name of Timothy, who's a leader in Africa, we were able to provide menstrual cups for 40 girls in a village. And they then sat, signed pledge cards saying that they were going to stay in school because they weren't going to school. Oh they didn't. Oh my gosh. That's, that's, that's life changing, right? It's totally. Life changing. Generationally. So, generationally. So. Like I read his email and just got goosebumps, but truly a place where people can go to get inspired and to get the tools and skills they need just to do good in the world. I love it. And, and that's part of what I'm, you're, you're one of those people that are recognizing, I, I think much like myself, that there is this, there's kind of this shift. Um, and people aren't, people aren't fulfilled by just showing up anymore. Like it has to be purposeful and it has to be heartfelt and it has to be like, I need to see tangible change through my work. I need to see tangible benefit from my effort. Yes. Right. And it's not, a, it's not a, Oh, so I can feel good about myself. Right. Like I know you don't do the work that you do cause you, you know, cause you need the confidence boost, right? Like you're doing what you're doing because you're enabling and equipping other people to have impact and change. Right. And I know that we share kind of this, this, uh, kindred spirit around like our joys come when we see other people living fulfilled and purposeful lives and, yes. and finding that connection. Um, and I love that movement maker tribe is a thing and a, a growing community and a place of impact. Um, it's not just like a feel good, you know, daily dose of sunshine. It's like, Hey, these are real problems and real opportunities. And, and this is how in, you know, detail with, links to resources and people and places like there's no reason why people can't get off their ass now right like all <laughs> you eliminated all the excuses <laughs> you just cleared them all out you're like nope not today like get to work right and and i love that and i think i think the impact that what you're doing you know not just with movement maker tribe but in all of your efforts is going to be something that really legacies are built from um your own as well as others and i am i am proud to to know you and to support your effort and i i'm telling everybody about what you're doing oh thank you and you you get all of this because you do <laughs> in your community, which is why i just admire you so much um but you know keep doing the work that you're doing is so important um and you know add on the dot so many people love it i took notes and i still have it on my my desk you know so it's just it's also just so nice um to have people like you that i can get energy from that can also inspire me and that might even laugh if i post another thing on instagram about how i wore my underwear inside out and didn't even realize you know? um, I love those. I love the candid behind the scenes stuff, right? Like that's, that's the stuff that is like, that's the insider scoop that like your friends get to see, you know, and, and Instagram stories is where there's no filter and nobody takes time to make it pretty. Right. You like, you're just like, here's the randomness happening in my life. <laughs> Come along with me. Right. And, and I, I love that you just show up real and whether it's exhausted or plane delays, or I know you've had all sorts of adventures lately, <laughs> oh like your gosh. schedule is crazy. I'm tired just like watching your schedule, like let alone walking in it and you show up with the same energy and in, in front of every crowd. I mean, you are someone who knows how to show up in a room. And oh, 
you're so kind, but I still need your tips to please keep that <laughs> moving. And I'm a subscriber. I want the content. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm working on it. It's part of part of my plan. You're helping me be brave and continue to to show up and share those things. Um, I. I'm, I'm going to continue to tell everyone I know about movementmakertribe.com. Where else can people connect with you? Where can they find out more about your work or, you know, see the random squirrely travel adventures? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Definitely on Instagram. It's Terry, T-E-R-R-I, B as in boy, then Williams. Uh, same on Twitter. And on Facebook, Movement Maker Tribe is how you can find me. And I, I do answer email and reply. Um, if someone takes the time to say hello, I'm definitely going to take the time to say hi back. Awesome. Well, I will link that up in show notes as well um, when this goes live so people will have it for easy reference. And I cannot encourage you enough um, you know, to, to my crew here that's listening and tuning in, like connect with Terry. Um, there is something, she's got something to tell you. I don't know what you need to hear, but I can tell you that she's got something that, that you need. Um, so connect, go to movementmakertribe.com, connect there. She's got swag, like awesome Yay! swag, cool merch. Um, <laughs> so you can, you can rep, rep it there as well. Um, but yeah, thank you, Terry, for sharing your passion and your energy with me and uh, with everybody listening and tuning in today. Uh, I appreciate you. you so much. Thank you. You're a little fire starter and a movement maker yourself. <laughs> <laughs> like attracts like, right? We only hang out with awesome people. Um, but yeah, so until uh, the next episode, this is all about powering your presence here at the Lisa Mitchell Show. Um, you can find me at powerbodylanguage.com. You can connect with me on Instagram if you want to see my randomness. It's at Lisa Mitchell Indy. Um, and then we will just keep powering our presence together and showing up in the room the way we want to.